This is a podcast and I'm Louise Dickens. Before we introduce our guest, here's a quick word from our sponsor. Hi, I'm Leon Cantor from Future Place, organizers of the largest tech and innovation event for real estate in Australasia, the Real Estate Innovation Festival, taking place from 9th to 10th of November in Sydney. For more information, please visit realestateinnovationfestival.com. Today on the PropCast, we'll be discussing why global real estate leaders are refocusing their investment strategy and turning to BC to help reach net zero. And our special guest on today's show, Guy Granger, JRL's Global Head of Sustainability and ESG Services, Taylor Westcote, General Partner of Concrete BC. Welcome to the show, Guy and Taylor. Hi, Lou. Thanks for having me. Thanks a lot, Lou. Looking forward to it. Today, we'll be hearing how and why both Guy and Taylor's careers have refocused within the sustainability space. Taylor will be sharing with us the big plans with the Sustainable Fund and how they managed to get some huge real estate names like Segro, JL, Ardent to invest. Guy will talk us through JL's strategy around net zero and their involvement in the fund. It will also share how technology internally and externally will help businesses and obviously reaching these goals. Now, I'm sure you might have seen Guy or Taylor speak on this topic before one of the many videos online, but they'll be sharing with us what obstacles the industry faces and what we really need to do to overcome them and hopefully sharing with us some useful examples too. So without further ado, I'd love to start with the question. So Guy, for our audience who may not know about your sort of career or who you are, your involvement in this space, obviously I know you have a passion for helping cities invest in businesses in the transition to net zero carbon, but for our audience who don't, can you talk us through how you end up as Global Head of Sustainability and ESG Services? Obviously previously you were UK and EMEA CEO for JRL. So yeah, if you give us a sort of quick overview, that'd be super helpful. Thanks. Yeah, I suppose I'm one of those rare breeds that went from being a CEO to actually dedicating myself full time to sustainability for two mm. reasons, really. One, whilst being a CEO is an amazing responsibility and you have an enormous amount of influence and accountability. I was looking for a really purpose driven career path, having spent eight years as a CEO and five of those on the global executive board. So we had a big strategy around sustainability, but we didn't really have a focused investment plan and leadership around it. So uh, I agree with our global CEO that I would take this on and really drive our growth strategy around sustainability services internationally, which is pretty exciting. Feels a bit like yeah. a startup within a big corporate, yeah. actually. So you know, we're, we're out recruiting and looking how we can uh, grow our capabilities in multiple countries to give clients actually that that sort of silver bullet of a seamless integration of strategy across multiple geographies, which is really hard to do. I can imagine, especially comparing completely different geographies from the US to Europe to sort of APAC. Obviously, we'll be hearing a bit more about this strategy later on and what your actual involvement is within that space. But Taylor, for our audience, you're obviously general partner of Concrete BC, which recently launched a 100 million euro fund backed by obviously names, like I mentioned, for Segro, JLL, Argent. Can you please expand on a bit more how on this fund, but also how you got to founding up your partner, Arno, as well? So there's a limited amount, I can say, for compliance and SEC reasons. But in brief, we've created an investment platform that continues on what we've been doing for the last five years with with JLL and with Starwood Capital in helping large real estate organizations see more deeply and more clearly into the early stage tech space that they understand will be creating and driving change in their in, in their industry. And I guess in terms of what we do, my partner Arno and myself, and we met through actually appropriately an investment that his fund and Concrete had done into Measurable, a, a very real bellwether sustainability focused business in the U.S., we, we operate much like in my career in product management, where if you imagine a triangle on the bottom right, you have the technology on the bottom left, you have the user and at the, at the peak, you have the business and finding a place where they all meet is, is what I've always done in my career. And, and here with concrete, we continue to do that and find where the business achieves its goals in meeting what the users need with what the technology can provide. And all of those things move continuously. And so a move, very much a moving target. Awesome. Thank you for that. And those who don't know the business measurable, it's I think one of the world's most widely adopted ESG data management solution for commercial real estate. It's run by a fantastic planner called Matt. 
So check it out. But what a great investment to be involved in. So Guy, now talk us through, obviously you, you obviously moved into the role focusing on sustainability and ESG services. What JLL's involvement in Concrete's Fund exactly? Well, we've had a sort of partnership and collaborated with Concrete for many years and both in terms of investments. But we've invested in, in this new newly launched fund. We are making a lot of bets, actually, because to find the right technology products out there to serve businesses, they're not all going to succeed. So you need to be able to experiment in this market. And I must admit, knowing Taylor and his business for a while, he's got great insight and great experience. So because of our previous collaboration, we felt that this is going to really reap some rewards. And this is part of our ongoing investment through JLL Spark, part of our technologies business. Over the last five years or so, we've invested over $300 million in tech companies. In fact, no one probably watches our statements, but the last five acquisitions we made all tech companies. So a real departure, I suppose, for a traditional services company to do consolidation with similar type of companies. We're really trying to digitize our business and effectively sort of plug smaller, innovative tech companies into our platform because that's our real strength is this huge sort of infrastructure and platform and relationship with clients across the world. We need others to partner with us to help scale up the best innovation. And we think this fund will be, you know, one of the reasons or one of the facilities to do that through. Well, we've seen, I very much see JL as leading the way when it comes down to digitization. And it's not just down to fantastic marketing or anything. Like you said, the investments may have been huge and back to the concrete uh, and tailors to the track record. You mentioned Measurable, you've invested in other businesses like Infigrid, Landtech, Hubble. So it's a fairly diverse portfolio, which you have. Though these events are obviously fairly sector agnostic, and now you're focusing on ESG. So say if there's a founder listening in or for any of the audience, which is obviously a global listenership, what sort of investments are you going to be looking at? Is there any particular sort of strategy for them? So we're, we're excited about ESG, we're excited about data, and we're excited about overall efficiency. We think those are that those are three prongs that will create significant change within the real estate sector and start to build the ecosystems that the businesses being started today will will thrive in and and also create the ecosystems that new businesses will be created on top of right as we see more consistent data coming out of the sector new ai and new machine learning capabilities will evolve so at this point we're looking for pretty early stage companies we're eager to help founders that are just at the point where they're ready to start talking to the nature of partners that we have that, mm-hmm. that are back at us, like JLL, like Starwood, like Argent, like Seagrove, like Nuveen. And so not the earliest stage where maybe security isn't really worked out or product market fit is still really up in the air, but just a little further along where they're actually ready to go into a number of large commercial real estate buildings and start delivering the service level and the and the reliability and the impact that the world of real estate needs to see in order to build the confidence that that we believe they will eventually have in this prop tech sector. And you mentioned obviously some great partners, which you have obviously JLL included. Are you, will you be looking for more partners within this fund or what's the sort of strategy behind that as well? We're definitely looking for more partners. You know, we're at the beginning of a journey here and we're happy that The partners that we have had for the last five years have seen fit to continue supporting us, is supporting us and having confidence in what we do. And certainly, you know, one outcome of the pandemic and just time generally is that more and more real estate organizations are starting to realize at the top level. And let me Mm -hmm. take this to point out, it has to be decided at the top level. If it wasn't Guy, head of Europe, that said, all right, concrete. I buy what you're saying. We'll start to work with you. It, it doesn't mm-hmm. bump up from the bottom. It's got to come from the top. And we're seeing more of that start to happen. So yes, we are looking for more partners, you know, eager to have conversations with folks that are interested in learning about the space and delivering some impact in this ever-changing world of real estate. Amazing. I feel like impact such a key word there. Now, Guy, back to you. I'd love to hear a bit more about the standard strategy behind JL. Obviously, we, I see you obviously constantly sort of posting about what's happening as well in this sort of market. But in terms of JL's strategy and the services you offer to your clients, could you elaborate a little bit more on them? But also, what are your clients now asking you for? What is their big, obviously they're asking you to sell 
problems and get to net zero. But what are these services which you're helping? I guess you know the problem. What's the solution which you're offering them? Well, I think ultimately we're trying to get to an end-to-end solution from setting the strategy mm-hmm. right through to the execution and implementation of the pathway to zero carbon in buildings. And, you know, that's much easier said than done. I think the last sort of three years, particularly, we've seen an explosion in the number of strategies that are being set by companies, whether they are multinational corporates or real estate investment Mm -hmm. companies. It is no coincidence that it's come at a similar time that a lot of legislation and disclosure, financial disclosure and regulations come in, particularly in Europe, right? Let's not kid ourselves here. That has definitely (laughs) fast-tracked the market. But um, what we're trying to do is work with clients that are now looking to get beyond the reporting and disclosure phase and into the execution phase because no one's done it yet. And buildings are a real problem, particularly in cities. Now, they, in cities, they account for 60 to 80% of the carbon footprint of the harmful emissions. And we need to really embrace the fact that, you know, we're a big part of the problem. And until we start doing, as opposed to just talking about doing, then we're still part of the problem. And so, yeah, we're trying to really link things from having the consultants to set the strategies to then having the engineers to project managers to actually you know, work out the capex that's needed to transition mm. these assets, then to really link it to the operations of the building, because there's no point in creating a really efficient building if the tenant just kind of operates in there completely randomly. And ultimately, then you've got to have some advice around the infrastructure. Where are you getting the energy from? So there are quite a few different parts to this. And one of the biggest challenges that frustrates me is a lot of clients or colleagues always ask me to try and simplify it. When actually there's a need for us to really smarten up around this because there isn't uh, one single thing that you need to do to create a a zero carbon building. It's multiple things and you need to join them up end to end. So ultimately we're trying to bring in the expertise to our business that can do that and then link it back to the overall value impact because in the end, the driving purpose behind doing this shouldn't just be to create a better world, but it's also to protect economic value. And there is a direct link between transitioning a building to Mm. zero and creating economic value. And we need to prove that much clearer. I read an article and I might get this stat wrong and Guy, you can probably correct me that if you prove that your office space is, I guess, green or producing less emissions, this might just be in the notes that you can get, I think it was something like 12% more for leasing it. I will double check these stats and I will share it when I share this podcast, but it just shows you can get more value out of making a greener building. But there's also another issue which surrounds no one quite knows what, say, the government's net zero strategy. I read that. The one in which they just they published previously doesn't have to sort of has no details and sufficient measures to deliver legally binding emission targets. It's got no time frames either, and then they're going to take sort of eight months to review. I get change can't happen overnight, but it's a big thing for them not to get completely accurate, and that's also quite a long time if you just think of the time frame we're working to for eight months to review it. I know this wasn't part of our questions, but it's something which I read recently, which I know you've read as well, Guy. What are your thoughts on that? Well, if we wait for national governments to set the regulation, it'll be too late. And I think businesses are responding to this and they realise that to protect and manage the risk of climate change within their business model, they need to get ahead of the regulation. And I would really look much closer at cities and what cities are doing than national Mm. governments because you're seeing some really dramatic measures being taken by cities that are really restricting the amount of new buildings. For example, in London, they're getting very, very precious about lockdown and rebuilds because of the embodied carbon in concrete and steel. But you're getting a lot of cities really focusing on the operational energy of buildings. Uh, New York being a classic where they in 2024, bringing out a carbon tax, $268 a tonne, which when you can buy it on offsets at the moment for $10 a tonne, shows you how serious they are. And that's being charged mm. to the to the owner of the building on what the occupier is using. So I think looking at city regulation 
is far more interesting and moving far quicker. And you know, cities love copycat regulations, so they'll just all copy each other if something works. But we need to get it quicker than the regulation. And I think that's why the economic risk, and it's not just about green premium, it's also mm. about brown, brown discounts, is going to play out really interestingly, particularly in the financial markets. Every building has debt attached to it, virtually every building. If the finance starts changing on brown buildings or buildings that don't have a pathway to zero carbon, if it gets more and more expensive mm. for that, then it's really going to change the economic model. And I think that's where I think, you know, life gets really tasty for anyone investing into buildings that are not currently looking at this. Yeah. And you mentioned obviously about internal pro- products, concrete products, and GLT's done some great acquisitions like the Hank one, which is a sustainability product. And then obviously Kayla, you mentioned about concrete one as well. How do you to get your clients who actually use the technology though? So you're doing the great investments, you're acquiring some great products. What's the education that people need to do? Obviously, we're well, well aware of why you should do it. The guy just mentioned of the financial reasons why they should do it. Why is there hesitancy from some clients? Taylor, this might also work, be a question for you. Is you said you're looking for more partners. Why are not, not more real estate businesses you know, buy into this as soon as obviously we would all like. So I'll start with that. It's a really good question and, and one that has, you know, it's been it's been asked over the years and, and the answer remains confidence, right? So real estate is the category of every building being its own little PL. And real estate operates at a, you know, not not a tremendous margin when you think about debt service thing, when you think about operating costs and so forth, to add a new cost into a building, once you capitalize that over 20 years, when you're trying to sell that building later, can be pretty meaningful. They're careful. They're cautious. They want to see the examples of it really making an impact, right? So raising Mm -hmm. revenue, reducing costs at scale after you factor in the setup, after you factor in the training, and then you have confidence that company is going to be around to continue offering that monthly service that you're paying for at a, at a high level of quality, that's something that real estate needs to see more so than your average business sector who can turn on and turn off a SaaS product or quickly swap it out with a new one mm. within a matter of months. Right? It's, a, it's a little more real estate needs greater confidence in what they're putting in place. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, it does. And Guy, you obviously moved from being a CEO to very much focus on this space because of the interest and the passion. What do you think needs to be done to encourage more people to upskill, learn, or even go work in this sector? You obviously mentioned there's so many opportunities, there's huge growth, but you can't, this movement can't happen without, I guess, the support and the people within it. Obviously, I know yeah, I run a recruitment business, of course I'm saying that, but generally that is the case. What are your thoughts on education or what needs to be done in this industry to, I guess, us moving forward a bit, a bit quicker? Yeah, I think you have to play to people's curiosity and give them a reason to engage with upskilling on this subject. I think, you know, just in the same way that digital has been very disruptive to the way we behave, climate change is going to be equally disruptive. It's just not as obvious because the change isn't happening right in front of your eyes. You know, you're not given a new device to learn how to use. And I think this is also, as well as the cost, uncertainty and lack of confidence around embracing new technology within buildings, which Taylor referred to. I think there's also this idea that it's really disruptive. I mean, most buildings are run by people, like building managers. You know, the the mm. biggest gains we can make are on operational efficiency because pretty much most commercial buildings out there are dumb, right? They're heated and cooled the same way at the weekend as they are during the week when there's no people in them. And, th- you know, a lot of this can be automated, but there's a real fear about doing that real fear about losing control. So I think we're underestimating the amount of behavioral change that needs to come with this, as well as the amount of learning. And, you know, we are investing an enormous amount into upskilling our people so that it's not just sustainability experts that actually deal with this challenge. If we just leave it to them, then they'll be pushed away in the corner. It's up to all of us to embrace this and find out how the transition to a zero emissions world, a zero emissions economy even, yeah, what's our role in that? It doesn't matter whether you are an investor, whether you are an occupier of a building, a user of a building, or providing services of that building, all those jobs are going to be affected at varying degrees of speed. So 
I think upskilling is very much a way of helping to grow yourself, not only just in terms of your career, but in terms of actually how you embrace this challenge going forward. No, agreed. My brother, he actually hates it when I bring this up on the podcast, but he's an asset manager for a fund. Well, he's actually just moved, but he was at Catella. He looked at how he can make his business part more, I guess, green and what sort of technologies were out of whether it was like demand logic or I think he might have used Avora. I can't really remember. You mentioned about being inquisitive. He always had that inquisitive mind, mindset. I never give my brother a compliment, but I think more People in real estate should think like that, work at how, and also there's going to be the value add as well. It's not just about them putting time in because they want to sort of save the planet. I do think that needs to happen. You need, obviously, businesses need to put in the investment to upskill their current employees, but that you need to have people who want to learn more. I think in real estate, there's a few courses out there like Hill Break run by John Lovell, but I think the more education there is around that, not only just from obviously when you're in work, whether it's at university, but also at the schools school level but I think there's a huge amount to be done at grassroots so I guess more like Taylor said at the senior management level with people implementing these strategies or education plans and everything like that so I guess we're at the very beginning of this journey Guy you're slightly further ahead than the rest of us um, well, I, think, I think we are at the beginning <laughs> and I, I think one of the reasons property isn't moving faster is it's not being disrupted at the moment the industries that are really progressing around down the ESG journey are being massively disrupted. Or they mm. see see this as a complete sort of almost existential problem for their brand. So, so the technology companies are aware of that. They're probably investing more in sustainability than anyone else because they know their carbon footprint is damaging. Now, all of that data and all those data centers are creating a huge drain on the world. So they're doing a lot to deal with it. The car industry is getting massively disrupted but property industry is still a linear game, it's still a financial return on a capital investment. And if you haven't got that curiosity, you know, you've still done very well over the last 20 years. It's been quite an easy game. So like Taylor said, actually, technology intervention is costly. It's experimental. The results aren't all known. This is not territory that the real estate industry is used to. Well, I guess also it goes around to um, exactly what Taylor's planting. You're investing in these um technologies of the future and I guess more money is going to it so if any partners are listening in now I know we've got a large real estate listenership get in touch with Taylor Arno we've come to the LMRE part now but first here's a word from our sponsor With inflation at its highest since 1982, we want to make sure that both our clients and candidates are prepared for a shift in the prop tech market. A huge advantage of our consultants being 360 degree prop tech recruiters means that we can communicate regularly on both sides of the business. Our job is to make both the hiring process easier for clients and the job searching process easier for candidates. In short, a recession can be intimidating, unpredictable and tumultuous, but it doesn't need to be. We at LMRE are here to help. Head to our website, lmre.tech, and we can find the right talent for your company's needs. So we're coming to the end of the podcast, but how we finish it, Guy and Taylor, it's the LMRE part. So I'll break it out between both of you. So I would touch on a main lesson you've learned throughout your career. Taylor, do you want to go for this one? Main lesson I've learned throughout my working in real estate technology career is, and this may sound trite, but the nature of the building of relationships in the real estate sector, I think I've really started to appreciate where the opportunities are not super high frequency, like a typical commercial sector. You need to remain top of mind for the opportunities do arise to buy a building, sell a building, or you know, drop some technology into a building. So I really started to appreciate you know, the, it's, it sounds silly, but those walks at conferences where you're able to catch up with someone when they're when they're not in an operational state of mind and and really just hear what they're thinking about and, and where they want to go. The relationships are key. Um, I completely agree with that. I had this discussion, discussion with someone earlier. It's like, what actually, what's a key characteristic where you see a people being successful? And I said something very, very similar. It's that I also said about obviously looking after relationships, but developing them and giving people the time of day. And it's just so important. 
to develop these relationships. Now, Guy, is there anyone other than Taylor and Concrete I mean, you'd like to sort of give a shout out to? It could be a product, it could be a service on this podcast. Uh, no, I wasn't expecting that, actually. I was just trying to think about your very difficult question about the sort of learnings or lessons that we might be able to preach. Yeah. I haven't really got any shout outs. I mean, all I would say is to progress on this subject or mm. to channel your energy into trying to really deliver on this journey. We have to find the pioneers. I mean, what technology has taught us, taught us is that experimentation works. And through experimentation, you can find the right product and then you can scale it up and it can really create much more sort of efficient systems out there. And so that network that Taylor was talking about is really important, but network smartly, not just with people that look and sound just like you. Get into uncomfortable, unusual spaces where you're going to meet more diverse people who might have or adjacent industries that might have more pioneering or creative thoughts. And that's what's been amazing about my move is that I meet lots of people outside the real estate industry that can add so much value to what we're doing. And so that, I just encourage people to do that. Awesome. Thank you very much, that guy. Okay, the final two questions. So, are oh, Taylor, what's been the most rewarding part of working in the space? And I know you've slightly, you're now sort of refocusing on obviously on your sustainable fund, but if there's anything that sort of stands out for you? Yeah, sure. So, you know, in my career as a, as a as a product developer in the tech sector, I've worked across a number of industries, e-commerce and 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 content with timeout and you know communications with AOL. In the real estate sector, never have I seen a longer, more sustained uphill climb in learning that than I'm than I'm than I know I'm facing. So I have a huge appetite for learning. And if you believe the reward is the journey. The journey that I have been on for the last five years and the journey that I look forward to for the next 10 or 20 is there's constantly so much to learn in this space. And I love that, right? I love the complexities of how do we think about how people get their packages delivered in their resi or, or office building? How do we think about where they're going to park, where they're going to charge their car? How do we think about what kind of security breaches are going to happen in the near future and what do we need to protect against that, for example, our supply chain. So, so many exciting areas to think about. And that for me is a big reward. Awesome. Thank you. And Guy, the final question, uh, what are you most excited about in the future of it? I say prop tech in my question place, so I know too, but let's talk about within the sustainability world of real estate. Well, I got this from the two weeks I spent at COP, but I am really excited about batteries. I think batteries are going to save the world. You know, we've got a lot of anxiety just when you look at EVs at the moment, mm. electric vehicles, about how far we can drive on electric vehicle. I am pretty convinced that's all going to disappear. And it's going to disappear pretty quickly because the innovation around batteries is moving so fast. And imagine if we can store energy. That's a complete game changer. All those wind farms, all those solar farms, which produce lots of energy, but then it gets wasted because we can't store it. I think batteries are going to change the world. And the sooner we do it without the uh, sort of Rare resources like lithium that's currently used, the better. But I'm pretty sure that's happening really quickly. We've massively underestimated some of the technology out there in the mm. past. And I think keep an eye on batteries because they are going to change so dramatically. We're going to look back on this time and think, do you realize there was a time when you could only buy a car that would go 300 miles? That's going to be a thing of the past pretty soon. So if we can do that, then that will create a lot of good in the world. Yeah, watch the space, back to basics, back to batteries. Also, whilst you were um, uh, just talking about that, I looked up uh, the stat, which I didn't quite get right. So it's actually posted in BizNow in early on this year, and it's a JLL report on sustainability and the growing value of green. So it said that the value of certification like LEED and green certification result in a rent premium of 6% and sales premium of 8%. There's your value add for if you want to start making your buildings more green for those listening in. But on that note, I want to thank both Guy and Taylor for joining me today. It's been a pleasure. I hope you both enjoyed it and sadly we've come to the end, but I'm looking forward to catching up with you both after the show, but thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Lou. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Guy.
Making a high quality podcast like this one takes a lot of work. That's a fact. But not when you hire a podcast company. With our White Glove experience, we handle everything for you. From guest outreach all the way through to publishing and promotion, we handle it all. You show up to hold great interviews and build relationships with your guests, and we take care of everything else. Podcasting is not just about the audience. Every podcast interview is the start of a new relationship. With a weekly podcast, you'd build relationships with 52 ideal partners or prospects through your podcast interviews over the next 12 months. Do you believe that 52 new relationships would help grow your business? We do. Contact jason at apodcastcompany.com and let's talk.